Welcome to a new wave of entrepreneurship. I'm Latifa Farah, Associate Creative Producer at Venture for Canada and the producer of a new wave of entrepreneurship. The focus of this podcast is to hear from changemakers and Canadian entrepreneurs to learn about how they've developed their entrepreneur mindset and skills. In season five, we'll be chatting with CEOs, founders, and successful business leaders about their career journeys. We're excited to dive into these conversations about how to foster your entrepreneurial mindset and drive. Magalie Charbonneau is a seasoned entrepreneur and investor in many Montreal-based high-tech startups. From 1991 to 1999, she was owner and president of MD International in Ontario. Following the successful sale of the company, she invested in an emerging startup, Hostopia.com, joining the company as chief revenue officer in 2001 and contributed to its growth and to its successful acquisition. She then invested in Password Box and joined as the chief operating officer. She was employed by Intel Corporation until 2017. And Magali is currently a partner at Inovia Capital. Welcome to a new wave of entrepreneurship, Magali. How are you doing on this mid-November morning? Hi, Scott. I'm doing really well. Thank you for having me. Uh, fantastic. And I'm really excited to interview you today. Given all of your entrepreneurial uh, operations experience, what motivated you to make the shift from being an entrepreneur to being a uh, venture capital investor? Um, so I never really thought about it. Um, after we sold Password Box to Intel, we had to give Intel about two, three years um, uh, we were working, we were going to work there for two, three years as part of the package. Um, and uh, Chris Arsenault, <clears throat> one of the founders of Inovia, called me and basically said, uh, he asked me, what were my plans? And uh, said, hey, you know, are you interested in becoming a VC? So that's really how it happened. I never really thought about it or had planned for this. I then uh, became an investor in um, I know via fund 2015 and I joined the investment committee. Um, two years later, um, uh, having gotten to know the team, the culture, uh, I really, uh, really liked what they were doing, um, their mission, and I ended up uh, joining the team in 2017. How does your uh, previous experiences as an entrepreneur and an executive in, in uh, tech startup companies help you be a more effective venture capitalist? So I understand the journey of uh, a startup because I, I've been there. So at Inovia, we, we really want to bring value to the CEOs and the founding teams as past, some of us are past operators. And so um, it's not really about just the investment. It's about building a relationship, a trusting relationship. It's about aligning our values. And then we help them operate their business. We help them scale. Uh, personally, um, when I uh, speak to a CEO about his challenges, his problems, um, they're very clear to me. And I, I have empathy because I, I've been there and, I, and I've done it and I know it's hard. And we try to have honest conversations about challenges and um, try to bring value that way. Do you think that somebody can still be an effective venture capitalist if they've never been an entrepreneur or they've never actually worked in a uh, high growth company or, or a tech startup? Oh, yeah. So if you start in a VC firm as an analyst and you move all the way up to being a partner, and, uh, and we have that at Inovia, I think of, of my partner, Karam, in Toronto, uh, he... You, you, you learn the job by talking to CEOs. You don't have to have just one um, profile to become an amazing VC. I absolutely think you can be an amazing VC if you have never operated a company with a strong finance background um, and having live experiences, you know, investing all the way to exiting, you can be a great VC as well. Uh, Inovia is probably one of the most global of the Canadian venture capital uh, firms. That I would, I, I think that that's a fair comment uh, to to make. Uh, and but at the same time, one of the things that I've often heard uh, in my work in venture for Canada, where we work with hundreds of of high tech entrepreneurs across the country, is sometimes uh, complaints about Canadian venture capitalists. Uh, and I often hear, uh, 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 not necessarily people publicly say this, but a lot of entrepreneurs kind of behind closed doors say. You know, Canadian VCs are too conservative that they're, uh, you know, uh, need to learn more from their kind of like American counterparts. But my question uh, to, to you is that 
Uh, do you think that 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 the Canadian venture capital kind of ecosystem has a lot to learn from the United States, or do you think that these uh, um, constructive uh, uh, feedback by different entrepreneurs uh, is uh, is is fair? Well, so as an entrepreneur, when I was raising money, what was important for me <clears throat> in my cap table, I wanted the investor that I trusted, that I built a relationship with. Uh, was important for me to have the Canadian investor uh, to give back to my own ecosystem to give back to the economy here. Um, so I wanted both. I wanted the US-based investor to help me grow, to help with the network in the States and to help uh, US sales. And I wanted the Canadian uh, investor to, uh, because I knew they would have my back a little more than the US investor. So I think both are good. Um, <laughs> what you're saying about, you know, are we more conservative? Um, there's a lot of money circulating right now. There's a lot of capital circulating. It's tougher and tougher to win deals. Um, we are in our mission and in our vision. We like to build relationships with uh, the companies that we build, and it's actually uh, working. So in general, uh, in Canadian, Canadian venture capital, when you look at the partners of most of uh, Canada's uh, largest kind of VC firms, uh, it's still overwhelmingly dominated uh, by by men, uh, and in particular uh, by white men. What do you think uh, can be done uh, to uh, increase uh, diversity, equity, inclusion in the Canadian venture capital uh, ecosystem? So we're very proud to say at Inovia that in our investment team, <clears throat> we are now 50% women and 50% men. So we made a lot of effort um, to, to, to make that happen. Um, in my opinion, it's about education and it's about talking about this job that is a great job. Uh, last year, in the last couple of years, um, I was involved in El Invest, which is a group that goes to universities. And we talk about, uh, we talk to women in finance about this great job, um, uh, the, uh, being a VC. And uh, I think educating has to start earlier on so that women are going to be attracted to this job. So I, I think it has a lot to do with education and we have to talk about it more and we have to make a big effort. We have to talk about diversity. We, are, we have to talk. Um, we have, for example, we're, we're making uh, changes at Inovia, for example, in our term sheet. We have a clause that talks about the great board commitment and we ask the entrepreneurs to make an effort to have a diversified board. And uh, it's going really well. Um, it's a positive, uh, it's, we get positive feedback about that. So as the, the more gestures that uh, the ecosystem is gonna make, the, the, the better it's gonna be. On the topic of stress management, uh, and I, I think, and, and in the roles you've had, they're very stressful, they're very intense, uh, and uh, you have a lot of responsibility. Uh, what advice do you have for, for young people and for recent grads on uh, how to healthily manage stress while they progress in their careers? First of all, when you get into the business world, you know it's not a nine to five job. We at Inovia hire A plus uh, players, you know, um, finance graduate, top of their class. They have a lot of drive. I mean, meditation is, is an amazing tool to, uh, to try to, to stay calm. Um, I guess I would say it's okay to change your mind and um, try, to, try to be more relaxed. And, um, you know, I think if, you're, if you work really hard, you're smart, you have amazing work ethics and you stay humble. For me, humbleness is super important then I think everything's going to happen. And sometimes you can't plan, you know, your next promotion or your next raise or your next, um, I, I think staying, staying calm and meditating is a, is a good piece of advice. I agree about the importance of, of humility. Out of interest, when you see lots of entrepreneurs come in and pitch and, and you build lots of relationships, do you think that uh, uh, there's a correlation with kind of entrepreneurial success and, and having that sense of, of humility? Um, well, not every entrepreneur I meet is humble, but sometimes people evolve. And so sometimes we look at a deal and for whatever, for whatever reason, we pass the first time. 
whether it doesn't meet our investment criteria, whether we are not sure that this is the team to win. And then they come to see us two years later and we're still not sure. And then they come to see us two years later and then we finance them. So it's, it's not black and white. Um, so I think being humble is an important quality for everybody, <laughs> for my daughters, for CEOs, for our team members. I think being humble is important. I think having drive is fantastic um, as well. But arrogance is something that I really dislike. What do you think are the negative business consequences of arrogance? I just don't see the value of being arrogant. There is no positive of being arrogant. You can have amazing drive and be a fun person, have respect, have class, and be humble and have better results than someone that's arrogant. It's interesting because I sometimes I think in, in society, there's an image of these successful entrepreneurs as this kind of like Steve Jobs, of which there's certainly an image of him as being frankly arrogant. Uh, but the reality is, is I think most successful entrepreneurs are, uh, well, to your point, there are some people who border on arrogance. <laughs> uh, I would say that more, more tend to have a sense of humility, partly because if you build a really successful company and you're just in this long, you know, entrepreneurial journey, you uh, have so many failures along the way that I think it's hard to not have a sense of humility when it, even if someone's building a multi-billion dollar company along the way, they probably failed hundreds of times. And if somebody doesn't have a sense of humility after failing all of those times, I, I don't know, uh, you, you know, I, I, it would shock me. Um, in the, the sort of another kind of piece uh, that I was interested in exploring from your, your own uh, personal kind of career is, can you describe beyond kind of the coaches that, that you worked with, Magli, uh, who is a mentor that uh, you, that has had a particularly impact on your personal and professional development? The greatest organization for me uh, when I was in my 20s was YEO. As a matter of fact, I would uh, try to convince any young entrepreneur to join that group. So Young Entrepreneurs Organization is an organization that targets under 40 uh, entrepreneurs that have the criteria is you have to, have, to be under 40, uh, have a, like a million in revenue and be, I think it's 50% uh ownership in your company the they had a men, they had a forum group program a men, mentoring program and on a monthly basis we had conferences and all that and the mentor that was assigned to me made a made a big difference so um uh, i think as a young entrepreneur in your 20s the experts advisors and mentors that surround you will make a big difference in your life because uh, you're, you know, you're so young in your, in your 20s or early 30s, you don't have that 20 years experience that someone that has, a, has had a 30 year career can share and, and, and just, uh, you know, tell you stories that you can learn from. So for me, it made a massive difference. It's interesting. At Venture for Canada, we've supported a lot of uh, Canada's like leading uh, uh, companies along the way. And uh, including, you know, one point like ClearCo when it was an early stage company, a quarter of their of their employees were Venture for Canada uh, fellows. And I can say, you know, it's been remarkable and, and so inspiring to see like the building of a, We have another episode where we interviewed Charlie Feng, who's a Venture for Canada fellow, who's the co-founder of ClearCo. And that, that company pivoted like six times in the first few years. It went through so many ups and downs and almost like out of business. And now it's like a multi-billion dollar company. Uh, and I, and I'm sure Magali, like you have so many other examples of this, I'm sure from your own is like, is companies that are almost die that end up being incredibly successful. All of this is to say it's important, uh, importance of, uh, of, uh, persistence. So kind of on this point is, uh, how do you think that somebody can foster that the sort of internal strengths to persevere through intense uh, business hardship and, and challenges. If you're building a tech company, it's really important that the methodology that you use to build your product is data-driven. So if you A-B test and you want, and you resolve a real pain, you'll have the results that will make it much faster for you to succeed. I really want to hear what the data says when I meet an entrepreneur. And it's much easier to succeed when you follow what the data says, because very quickly the data might say, this is the, the, the size of the market is not big enough, or uh, the behavior of the customer is right on when, 
with this particular path, for example. So, you know, when you say, what does it take to be successful? How actually the methodology in which you're building your product. And if you're A-B testing every step of the way, you'll have a much better chance of finding the sweet spot um, and how to resolve. And, it, and is the market big enough to resolve a pain? And is there a business case there? So for me, that's really uh, important. It's not really the way that the entrepreneur is pitching or is he or is she telling me a good story? Uh, you know, uh, we, we don't want to hear a story. We want to see the data. Yeah, it's something that has come up on, on many of the podcast episodes uh, as part of this show is the number one reason why uh, companies fail and in particular tech companies fail is they build something that nobody wants. Yeah, exactly. Or the size of the market is just not there. And ultimately, it comes down to having data that actually backs it up, right? Then, uh, and uh, and in particular, revenue speaks more than anything else. So, if somebody is able to have uh, consistent revenue growth, uh, that that can that, that probably uh, sells itself. So, one of the things that I also came across in, in the research in terms of Anovia is a, a little bit of growth, this, the the trajectory and, and the changing of uh, Anovia over time from. Uh, a smaller VC firm uh, founded by Chris Arsenault uh, that uh, wrote smaller checks. Uh, two more recently uh, in February 2021, Inovia announced that it raised $450 million uh, US uh, for a growth stage fund. So why has Inovia made that decision uh, to, uh, to be kind of a, a, a full cycle VC, investing not just in a kind of the earlier stage, but also to have that capacity to invest it at the growth stage? So we want to be in the journey of the entrepreneur all the way. So we, in 2018, Inovia announced uh, the latest venture fund. So venture is, you know, seed and, and A mainly. And then we, we uh, announced a growth fund. One of the reasons we wanted to launch a growth fund was so <clears throat> that when we invest in an entrepreneur, we bring value all the way to the end. So it doesn't mean we're going to finance your seed and then your A and then your B and then all the way to, 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 to pre-IPO because not every single company that we invest in earlier on will graduate into the growth stage fund. Um, but it's important for us to have capital uh, for the entrepreneur all the way for his entire journey. So it makes us uh, it, it basically gives us more power as a VC to, uh, to keep the companies in Canada, the headquarters in Canada, to keep the money in, the, to participate in the, uh, the Canadian economy. Uh, we want to keep those headquarters, those revenue in the country. We, want, we don't want the entrepreneur to leave every time he's, uh, he's uh, getting to a series B and a series C and up, and all of a sudden he has to go to the States. We, we want to keep the Canadian founders here and have capital for them all the way. I was recently researching uh, an upcoming uh, episode and we're interviewing Martin Paquin, who is the uh, co-founder of Sonder, and uh, which I believe Anovia has invested in uh, as well. Uh, and uh, one of the things I noticed with Sonder's history is that it started in Montreal, then moved to San Francisco, and now they're building out their Montreal office again, although they're, they're still headquartered uh, in, in the United States. Do, do you think that you know, today in, in 2021 versus, you know, five or six years ago, that it's easier for, for Canadian entrepreneurs leading high growth companies uh, to, to keep their headquarters in Canada uh, rather than, than moving to the United States. Oh yeah, it's much easier today, absolutely. There's more growth capital. There's never been more growth capital in the country uh, than, than today. So uh, we're, we're very proud of where the Canadian uh, tech ecosystem is. We're gonna continue launching funds we launched our second growth fund uh, this summer. Uh, the first one was in 2018. The other one was this, was this year, the one you just announced. And uh, it's going to keep going. So we're, we're very proud of where it's at. And yes, it's absolutely easier to raise money in Canada than it's been before. One topic that I find a lot of our listeners are often confused about is what is the process that venture capitalists actually make their investment decisions? So in this interview, you've referenced a lot of investment committees and kind of talking about it with, with your partners. Can you walk us through kind of step-by-step step from like the first meeting in which an entrepreneur kind of comes and pitches you to like signing the check to invest in that company? What does the investment uh, process look like? So the entrepreneur comes to see us. Um, we have a first meeting. 
then if we're interested and it fits our criteria, we have specific criteria, obviously revenue traction, revenue uh, tr growth traction, tech mode, competitive landscape, size of the market are all important. Um, then we, uh, we do a due diligence for about a week. We ask for a data room if they have a, a data room. Right now I'm talking about the venture uh, process. And then they come to a partner pitch. They come to pitch to the entire investment team. Um, during that pitch, there are specific things we ask them to prepare and to talk about. And then we debate internally and we see if this is a fit for our portfolio. And uh, if the team is positive and there's excitement around the deal, then we tell the entrepreneur that we would like to do uh, a deeper due deal. So it could be, um, our C we now have Steve Woods internally, he's uh, I know we have CTO, it's, uh, he was hired this year. We're super excited, he's an operating partner. And uh, his role is to help our portfolio companies, CTOs build amazing engineering team. His role is also to help us on technical due deal. So I might say to Steve, how can you spend an hour or two with their CTO to see what the tech is all about? Uh, we dig in deeper to the data room. We do a deep uh, analysis on projections. And that can take probably one week and a half or two. And um, we tend to give an answer very quickly. So we're not gonna make the entrepreneur wait, especially now <clears throat> we, we find entrepreneurs get finance really fast. Within, within a week or two of the investment team pitch, then they get a term sheet. Um, and then legal starts, I would say within three to four weeks, then the check is in their bank account. Well, another area that I find a lot of recent grads are confused about is what are the day-to-day -day looks like of a uh, an analyst in a venture capital fund? So the, the more entry-level kind of roles. Uh, how do venture capital analysts uh, support the process that you just mentioned? So they're there all the way. Um, <clears throat> the analysts in my team, uh, they um, they will help analyze the, the, the data in the data room, for example. They will be there during the pitch. They will ask questions. Uh, they do an, anal an analysis on the competitive landscape. They'll come back and uh, present a presentation on, on their findings. Uh, then they'll dig into the financials and do projections and check the numbers and check the sales funnels, do analysis on the sales funnels, a big analysis on the total addressable market. Um, oh, this didn't make sense and not sure how they calculated total addressable market. Uh, maybe we should dig in there. So all of the analysis around the data, the finances, the competitive landscape and the TAM. So there's a lot that for our listeners, the, uh, analysts definitely have a significant uh, responsibility and it's a great way to learn. One of the things kind of going on right now is as we interview, as this interview takes place in mid, mid November, 2021 is, is asset prices across the board are incredibly expensive. Look at real estate, uh, cryptocurrency, the stock market. Uh, it, it, there, there's definitely a, a lot of froth in the market in general. Do you think that there uh, is too much froth in, in the venture capital landscape right now? Do you think that as in, that there, there's challenges relating to overvaluation of deals? Again, not speaking specific to anything that you have, but more just saying in general, in terms of the, the overall ecosystem. Yeah, uh, you said it well. There's a lot of capital circulating, so valuations are very high. And the, <clears throat> the challenge that is happening is the talent on war. So when valuations are high, budgets, budgets are, are more aggressive. VCs want the companies to grow faster and to grow faster, you need to hire faster. And right now the challenge that is happening is difficult to hire. It's difficult to hire. Um, and there, there's a lot of employee churn because they're leaving for more paying job, for higher paying jobs. Um, some of our portfolio companies, employees come to see the CEOs and say, hey, there's a US-based tech company that's offering me 50,000 US more. I can work in my living room. I don't have to go anywhere. So the, this is creating a challenge. Um, so hiring faster, deploying the tech faster, and, um, growing into your valuation are, are gonna be challenges. We're gonna see where we're at in two, two, three years from now, but the good news is that the, 
most of our portfolio companies are really well funded. And so there are, there's, there's capital there. We just have to be able to hire faster and grow into this valuation. Um, if the size of the market is there and they're massive markets, uh, it, sh it, it should be fine. But the CEOs are, uh, are struggling at hiring fast enough. BDC, Business Development Bank of Canada, has done some studies that show uh, venture-backed Canadian companies or kind of scale-up companies uh, pay significantly less for their top talent uh, in comparison to their American uh, counterparts. And that that is part of the reason why Canadian companies sometimes struggle to retain uh, top talent. Uh, do you think that Canadian company, or do you think in particular Canadian scale up companies or, or venture backed uh, technology companies uh, should move to, to increase uh, the, the compensation that they're offering uh, key employees in line with their American counterparts? It's a good question. We are talking about that at every single one of my board of my board meetings. We're definitely doing um, the equation. We're doing the the analysis. Um, some of our companies are doing top ups. We want to be market, so a lot of benchmark. Um, and some of my portfolio companies are finding their talent outside of Canada in countries where talent is available or maybe uh, we're actually paying what we're paying here outside of Canada. So there, there's all kinds of uh, situations like that going on, but it, it's a good question and we are talking about that. We're trying to find solutions. It's a, it's a fascinating time. Definitely uh, a significant war on talent and more people are, I think, leaving jobs in general right now. Uh, as the pandemic kind of wanes down uh, than, than ever uh, before. There's the phrase uh, in the United States, I think it's like the great uh, re resignation that people are talking about of, of uh, people kind of stayed put during the, the pandemic, but now are, are kind of looking uh, to, to change. And it's easier to change now because of the rise of remote work than it was ever uh, uh, before. Uh, it's been fascinating to learn more about kind of the venture capital ecosystem uh, in, in general. It has been a, a real pleasure chatting with you. We covered a lot of different topics uh, from kind of uh, the use of uh, French in, in the Quebec startup ecosystem to uh, how uh, Anovia runs its investment process and the importance of growth stage funding, your, your personal kind of career covered a lot in, in the last hour or so. Thank you so much for coming on uh, the podcast today, Magali. It was a true pleasure speaking with you. That's it for this week's episode of A New Wave of Entrepreneurship. Stay connected with us via our social and our email list. Subscribe to us in your favorite podcast app so that you don't miss our next episode. If you have feedback on today's episode, tweet us at Venture4Canada, that is Venture, the number four, Canada, or email us at podcast at Venture4, that's spelled F-O-R, Canada.ca. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. I'm Scott Stewart, and until next time, stay safe, stay motivated, and stay grateful. A New Wave of Entrepreneurship is produced by Winita Lee Garcia and Latifa Farah. Editing and mixing also done by Latifa Farah. Erica Ormanston is our editorial assistant. Mark Wallach and Premium Beat own the copyright and publishing rights related to the song used in this podcast. The comments and opinions, recommendations, or suggestions expressed on the podcast by the guests are not liable to Venture for Canada and belong solely to each individual. Any information provided stated by our guests and our host is independent of Venture for Canada. A new wave of entrepreneurship is a Venture for Canada brand and all content is owned by Venture for Canada. If you'd like to use our content, please reach out to us at podcast at venture4, that's spelled F-O-R, Canada.ca.